to this uh, short series on prevent and counterterrorism and freedom, which we are delighted to see such a great opponent. It's an issue that concerns us all. And so the most important thing is that we start with Ken. I'd like to say a few things about him. We have a particularly distinguished uh, first speaker who also needs to be praised and to be spoken about. So it gives me great pleasure to have him in this position <laughs> where I can speak about him and all of his distinguished qualities and his virtues. And he has to sit here, and I hope he won't get up and leave. <laughs> uh, he's also the warden of this college, uh, Sir Ken McDonald. Uh, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a potted biography about him to introduce you to him and to put in context this first lecture about Prevent in the Academy. Sir Ken McDonald, if you see, was called to the bar, I hope you correct me, by the Inner Temple in July 1978. He distinguished himself as a defense lawyer, established a diverse practice, <coughs> ranging from business and corporate crime to terrorism, quote unquote, I would put, and espionage, quote unquote, before becoming a Queen's Counsel in 1997. By the late 1990s, he co-founded the Matrix Chambers, illustrating his enduring commitment to human rights. He became a recorder in the Crown Court in 2001. In 2003, he was elected chairman of the Criminal Bar Association and appointed director of criminal <coughs> prosecutions to be here a few months later. In this capacity, he was celebrated for his conscientious, what I would call citizenry, and his legal capacities for public accountability, providing vital independence voice within the criminal justice system, championing, defending uh, defendants' rights, fair trials, and the exclusion of evidence obtained by torture. In particular, he offered a vital critique of government rhetoric surrounding the so-called war on terror. Sir Kren courageously identified the threat to the process posed by successive anti-terror policies enacted during his tenure, cautioning against, quote, I quote, a fear-driven and inappropriate, unquote, response to alleged threats. Through numerous media appearances, articles, and notable speeches, for example, his address to the Criminal Bar Association of 2007, he has defended civil liberties against the infringement in the name of security. He's expressed particularly vocal opposition to plans to extend the time that terrorist suspects can be held without charge to 42 days. Towards the end of his term as DPP in 2008, he urged caution in the face of new surveillance powers being introduced by the government, stressing that we should be careful to imagine the world we are creating before we build it. We might end up living with something that we cannot bear. Sir Ken subsequently became trustee of Index on Censorship. He was further nominated chair of Reprieve, the anti-death penalty organization. In 2010, he was appointed a deputy high court judge. He became a member of the House of Lords in the same year. Awarded the knighthood in 2007, was a visiting professor of law at the LSE, before becoming warden of Wadden College in 2012. And I'd like to say two final things. Sir Ken has made a very vigorous and ardent um, case for freedom when the prevent legislation was going through the House of Lords. But the second thing, and the final thing I'd like to do in introducing him, to say the most important thing about him was he was an undergraduate at Teddy Hall, where I taught where he did the B. <laughs> Introduction around the term terrorism, and I agree with those inverted commas. Um, uh, I'm going to be using terms like terrorism <coughs> during um, my address to you because these are forms of shorthand, but this is not a talk about what terrorism, inverted commas, is, um, what it constitutes, what caused it, uh, or indeed what the answer to it uh, might be. And I just want to make that clear. This is a uh, a brief talk um, about PREVENT and the impact that it could conceivably have in the academy, that is to say in universities, and how we might mitigate um, that uh, impact. This series of seminars, there are four in total, are, is going to address 
uh, prevent in broader terms um, later on. And, and I'd encourage you to attend the later seminars if you want to engage in broader discussions about whether prevent uh, is in its, on its own terms a, an appropriate government uh, uh, response to perceived threats or whether it is itself uh, a threat. Um, this session uh, this evening is going to focus fairly narrowly um, on the academy. I want to start with two um, quotations. Both of them are about prevent. Uh, one is from the Prime Minister, David Cameron, and the other is from David Anderson, QC, who is the uh, lawyer who has been appointed by Parliament to act as the independent reviewer of terrorism legislation. So let me first of all start with something the Prime Minister said about Prevent a few months ago. He said this, For too long, we have been a passively tolerant society, saying to our people, as long as you obey the law, we will leave you alone. In contrast, the Conservative politician speaking there, which is interesting, uh, in contrast, David Anderson, QC, wrote this about Prevent. If it becomes a function of the state to identify individuals who are engaged in or are exposed to non-violent extremist activity, it will become legitimate for the state to scrutinize and for the citizen to inform upon the exercise of core democratic freedoms by large numbers of law-abiding people. David Anderson went on to say the government could make a case for doing this, but it better be a very strong case and it better be a case that's properly scrutinized. Now this evening I want quite briefly to contrast these two approaches and to examine their relevance to life um, in our universities. But let me start, please, by acknowledging a problem. And this is where words like um, terrorism, I suppose, might creep in. It seems to me to be beyond argument that this new century has seen a surge in the need for preemptive international and domestic security action. I'm not going to go into the reasons uh, for this, because that's a different and lengthy debate that would take more than one evening to conduct. Uh, and importantly, I'm going to put aside the role of state force in this context, or the responsibility uh, of states, including our own, uh, for some of the events that have transpired more recently. But suffice it to say, for tonight's purposes, that few countries seem to be immune from randomly occurring forms of political violence that come, perhaps rather alarmingly, from scattered and diffuse groups that are particularly tricky to monitor. And again, I'm putting aside for the purposes of this argument uh, the exercise of state force. <coughs> These groups, the groups to which I'm referring, and the groups that the government is particularly concerned about, uh, are peopled by protagonists, many of whom profess a religious motivation that seems to make them impervious to any conventional human reluctance to face personal demise. Of course, this is nothing new. Throughout the ages, it's always been possible to find people who are prepared to go, for example, on suicide missions. But nevertheless, it's a proclivity that may make these organizations in the eyes of a government particularly dangerous. Perhaps one of the more sinister totems of this current period has been that rather chilling taunt, you love life, we love death. Not surprisingly, this is not a justification, but not surprisingly, these developments, whatever their genesis, have led many of those who feel themselves to be targeted to harbour very broad feelings of insecurity, even to a perception that the world is now so unsafe that we can't trust our fellow citizens. We find ourselves, it's obvious I think, in territory that is very fertile for the development of increasing paranoia around supposed enemies within. Again, there's nothing new about this phenomenon, but it's a dangerous one. But it is worth pointing out, and perhaps is not pointed out often enough uh, by policy makers who come up with ideas like this, <coughs> that a reaction to politically motivated violence that sets citizen against citizen, or encourages a government to appear to stigmatize one section of the community as a security threat over others, are both absolutely explicit goals of the organizations that inspire this form of violence in the first place. 
It's also worth observing that these feelings of insecurity have inevitably led to a relentless demand for intelligence gathering to inform preventive action. <clears throat> intelligence leading to prevention has become the holy grail and the focus of much of the government's current domestic security policy. One example of this, it's particularly relevant to me as a criminal lawyer, is that policymakers have wanted the criminal law to develop tools to intervene earlier and earlier in criminal enterprises, and specifically in the area of terrorist crime. It's often said there's no point arresting a suicide bomber after they've detonated their bomb. So criminal uh, and security legislation has tended to become more and more intrusive. Acts of encouragement, or acts preparatory to acts of terror have become in themselves explicitly criminal. We're going further and further back, it seems to me, into people's minds. Of course, this desire for intelligence, allied to a broadening process of criminalization of the sort that I've just described, has made it inevitable that increasing numbers of citizens have become subject to the attentions of the security agencies in recent years. Indeed, since 1998, the surveillance of the communications by the security agencies has more than quadrupled. To summarize, we can see that terrorism, as it's described, is a classic securitizing force, and that recent legislative and operational measures to counteract terrorism have inevitably drawn in a wider and wider range of behaviors, and a wider range of people. And prevent is obviously an important part of this process. That all says, I do think that institutions of higher learning must acknowledge the risk that radicalization presents to some young people. Young people face all sorts of risks, including racism, uh, sexism, discrimination, uh, and many others. But radicalization, I think, can also be seen as a risk, and a risk that needs to be managed. We have, as we can observe from the world around us, moved from a world where some young men and women have graduated not in history or in maths, but from terror porn on the internet to the real thing in Syria uh, and Iraq. And this matters a great deal. Uh, and it matters a great deal when they decide, if they survive, uh, to come home. And there's no point, I think, being naive about this. But in this context, it's at least arguable that universities should have some mechanisms allowing them at least to identify people at risk and to mitigate that risk when it occurs. And this, I think, is the broad context within which the government's prevent strategy should be assessed, and I want to turn to that now. The redesigned prevent that strategy was set out in 2011, uh, based upon uh, a policy developed by the earlier Labour government. Its stated, <coughs> the stated purpose was, quote, to reduce the threat to the United Kingdom from terrorism by stopping people becoming terrorists or supporting terrorism, which is a grand um, in our vein. It had three specific strategic objectives. These were, one, to respond to the ideological challenge of terrorism and the threat we face from those who promote it. Two, to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism and to ensure they're given appropriate advice and support. And three, to work with sectors and institutions where there are risks of radicalization that we need to address, which is where now the universities come in. According to the coalition government, it had specifically developed this new prevent strategy, quote, to deal with all forms of terrorism and with nonviolent extremism, which can create an atmosphere conducive to terrorism and can popularize views which terrorists then exploit. So it's not terrorist views that need to be controlled, it's views that terrorists might exploit, which is a much more complicated notion and a much more complicated definition. It also made clear that, quote, preventing people becoming terrorists or supporting terrorism requires challenge to extremist ideas where they are used to legitimize terrorism and is shared by terrorist groups. And the strategy also means intervening to stop people moving from extremist, albeit legal groups, into terrorist-related activity. Now, let me start by saying I do think it's an error to see the birth of the prevent strategy in overly conspiratorial terms, as some people are inclined to do. These broader <coughs> issues will be looked at in more detail later in our seminar series, so I won't trespass on them too far. But I would like to say that I recall from my own time in Whitehall a real concern um, in some quarters that there was a serious issue here, right or wrong, you can agree or disagree, 
the serious issue here of the vulnerability of some young people and a belief with some justification that exploitation strategies are being employed in the process of radicalization. It's quite hard to deny that exploitation, including very cynical exploitation, can feed the radicalized pro pro radicalization process. Of course, much else does as well, and I'm not pretending this is simply a question of exploitation, but we see evidence of exploitation daily. For example, some of the people, uh, apparently radicalized, no doubt by life experience, but also on the internet, who have traveled to Syria, have been very young indeed. We're talking about very young people, not much more than children. And, and many, of course, have been killed once they got to Syria. It's also, I think, from what we know, highly likely that some of the very young women who have gone to Syria have been seriously sexually abused there <coughs> upon their arrival. So I think it is entirely legitimate for government to take an interest in radicalization, even beyond <coughs> its immediate security implications, and to have developed its own strategies to combat it. I think that's obvious. And again, we'll be exploring these broader issues later in this seminar, the seminar series. But what I think it's absolutely critical to understand, this is absolutely critical, and it's not, I think, I'm sure everyone in this room understands it, but it's not widely understood, is that many, perhaps most of the behaviors targeted by PREVENT are behaviors that are not in themselves criminal in any way whatsoever. Now, this has major implications for the meaning of PREVENT in civil society generally. So that whatever the government's motivation, ministers have in fact created a policy response to radicalization that very much intensifies the strength of surveillance and government reach into people's everyday lawful lives, and indeed into whole areas of their everyday lawful discourse, just as David Anderson predicted would occur. This, of course, is particularly important in the context of prevents potential impact in the academy, precisely because of the mission in which universities are engaged, which is to say the mission of intellectual development and exchange, the exploration of ideas, the free and so far as possible unfettered employment of rhetoric and research in creating human understanding. Obviously the notion of surveilling or even policing non-criminal discourse in that sensitive environment is spectacularly problematic. So let me now turn to prevent in the universities. This uh, issue arises in the Counter-Terrorism and Security Act 2015. Section 26.1 of that Act imposed for the first time a duty upon universities to play a formal role in the government's prevent strategy. They must have, quote, due regard to the need to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism. And with these fairly anodyne words, we have acquired a statutory duty hitherto uh, confined to public authorities, like local authorities, to assume a role in the government's civil counter-terrorism mechanisms. David Panik, a crossbencher, and I put down an amendment to exclude universities from the prevent duty in the House of Lords. There was a two-hour debate in which every speaker from every party supported us, um, except uh, right at the end, when the spokesperson for the Labour Party stood up at their front bench and said that the Labour Party wouldn't support this amendment if it was pushed to a vote. Um, and so we were obliged, because we wouldn't then have won, to remove the vote, to remove the amendment, and we put forward a different amendment, which I'll explain to you um, in a moment. Under uh, the legislation, the Secretary of State issues statutory guidance to universities about the way they should exercise that duty, and universities have to have regard to that guidance. If the Secretary of State believes a university has failed to comply with its duties under the legislation, she can issue directions to enforce compliance, and ultimately she can apply to the court for a mandatory order requiring compliance with any directions that she's given. Let me pause to underline something. The idea that our universities should play a formal role in an apparatus of surveillance, detection, and control is a quite new one. And it's important to be absolutely clear that it envisages a relationship up until now undeveloped between institutions of higher learning and the security and law enforcement agencies of the state. 
it seems to me very obvious that we should tread this unforgiving ground with very great care. Indeed, it seemed to me, in helping to devise a strategy for the Oxford College's response to the new prevent duty, that it's absolutely incumbent upon us to measure the least, the least that is consistent with legal compliance, precisely because of the sensitive issues in play here. What precisely is it that universities are expected to do under the legislation? What's intended by their new role? It's set out in the guidance, and I want to take one very striking example, the part of the guidance that deals with uh, our rights under Article 10 of the European Convention, the right to free expression. The statutory guidance states, <coughs> universities must take seriously their responsibility to exclude those promoting extremist views that support or are conducive to terrorism. Extremism in this context is non-violent and is defined as Listen to this carefully. Definition of extremism. Violent or active opposition to fundamental British values, including democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, and mutual respect and tolerance of different faiths and beliefs. Now, any attempt to define or to list uh, what, is, what is described as British values is fraught with difficulty. Governments, most recently Gordon Browns, have tried to achieve it from time to time, with very little success and at the risk of a good deal, as I recall, of mockery. But even allowing for the difficulties inherent in this task, and assuming it's actually possible to achieve a workable definition, which I don't, the effort in the guidance is a very broad and highly questionable stab. It either tells us that we are to close down whole swathes of conventional discourse, or, more likely, it doesn't tell us anything uh, at all. The obvious confusion matters because the fact is that under this legislation, universities have acquired a specific enforceable duty to take steps to consider excluding views that are perceived to be contrary to these very broad concepts from being expressed on university premises. Of course, few people would quibble with the idea that, um, <coughs> that activity involving political violence or even propagandizing for political violence should be picked up and acted upon by university authorities. Actually, these obligations are already present under the existing criminal law. As so often when new security legislation is, is proposed, and I very often experienced this when I was director of public prosecutions, very often we already have legislation that deals quite ad adequately with the problem being addressed, but the government just feels it has to announce something and does so. We already have a, 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 an enormous amount of legislation that controls what people can say. Inciting murder is a crime. Inciting racial hatred is a crime. Inciting religious hatred is a crime. Encouraging or glorifying acts of terrorism is a crime. Calling for physical attacks on gay people is a crime. Arguably, calling for adulterers to be stoned is a crime. And it's unlawful to encourage the killing of British soldiers abroad. <coughs> I guess that no university would ever knowingly countenance an event at which such crimes were likely to be committed, with or without the passing of the Counter-Terrorism Security Act, not least because if they deliberately did so, they might find themselves, probably would find themselves, criminally liable under principles of agency. They might find themselves committing a criminal offence under pre-existing law. Now, as you've seen, prevent goes far beyond these constraints. It requires a university to do much more than to report a terrorist in the nest if we can possibly find one. Read literally, it envisages a future in which people might be constrained from arguing in a university of all places that democracy is wrong in principle, like Plato, for example, <laughs> or from giving a talk that, quote, fails to respect individual liberty or to offer mutual respect and tolerance to different faiths and beliefs. Uh, 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 and therefore excising from our curriculums whole swathes of our Western intellectual history. Indeed, under the terms of the guidance, the list of unacceptable topics might plausibly include much philosophical discourse. Any Marxist analysis of a supposed class basis for our rule of law and many atheist deconstructions of religion. I have to say, as an atheist, I'm very often disrespectful 
um, towards other people's religions. I had never thought that it would be uh, inappropriate me, for me to express a view of that sort um, uh, at the University of Oxford. To the response that uh, these forms of speech are not really the ones the government wishes to target, we might ask, well, who's to say and why not? They're all very well capable of fitting within the definition of the legislation. And it's not these types of speech one has to ask, is it because one person can, can, can critique the rule of law, but another person may not? And if so, where is the securing of our Article 10 rights to be found in permitting distinctions to be drawn simply by reference to the character of the speaker, rather than by any strict analysis of the content of the speech? And who's to make these calls? and under what form of authority or expertise. At the very least, we have to contemplate a level of uncertainty that risks a chilling effect uh, on intellectual discourse and exchange, not to mention a deadening impact upon research into difficult contemporary questions. And which of this discourse, which of this research, do we really feel we can do with less of at this time of all times? It's really quite difficult, it seems to me, to think of a more useful area of research in the field of public policy at present than that provided by intellectual interaction with jihadis and their propagandists in order to facilitate a better understanding of the genesis and development uh, of, of these ideologies, even to challenge or to rebut them. The International Centre for the Study of Radicalisation at King's College London comes to mind. I, I want, however, um, to move on from that to a chink or perhaps a shaft of light because if all this sounds very depressing, there's one uh, major shaft of light. At least I think it's a major shaft of light. I'm interested to see at the end of uh, my remarks whether you are uh, inclined to agree. Actually, I think this shaft of light illuminates quite nicely the essential problem with PREVENT in the Academy and the real reason that its role will always be very strictly limited in institutions of higher education. Uh, and this shaft of light, I think, demonstrates that the strict limitation I speak of doesn't result from some political or ideological opposition to prevent. Rather, and I think very refreshingly, it results from a positive legal obligation. The fact is that the prevent duty will only operate in institutions of higher education under the strictest limits, because those strict limits are mandated by pre-existing law. Let me explain. As a result of amendments made to the Counterterrorism and Security Bill in debate in the House of Lords, universities, when they're considering the exercise of their duties under the Counterterrorism and Security Act, are now required to have particular regard to other explicit legal obligations they have under a much earlier piece of legislation, namely the Education No. 2 Act of 1986, which I'm sure all lawyers present are intimately acquainted with. Now, since this latter piece of legislation was born during Margaret Thatcher's premiership, you might at first blush think it's surprising that it would provide any succour in the context of protecting universities from the depredations of prevent. <coughs> Mrs Thatcher wasn't famous for her love of universities, and she certainly wasn't famous for her love of Oxford, which feeling I think was pretty warmly reciprocated. <laughs> and she wasn't soft, she left all of her, I think she left all of her papers for another university because she wasn't given a honorary doctorate here. Um, she wasn't soft on security issues either. But the duties which universities have under the Education Act actually came about precisely because Mrs. Thatcher didn't like us. And it happened this way. In the 1980s, those of you old enough to remember, and I look at Geoffrey Hackney here, will remember that many students around, student unions around the country were operating no platform policies. There's a familiar um, expression. And certain Tory politicians, including notably Education Secretary Sir Keith Joseph, were being howled down every time they came to speak on university premises. They couldn't make themselves heard. This made the government very angry. And actually, I don't blame them. It was abusive and wrong, <coughs> and I think inimical to everything that universities should stand for, but it was happening. So in order to deal with it, ministers inserted a clause in the Education Act imposing on universities a positive duty to secure freedom of speech on their premises and, importantly, to secure it for visiting speakers too. Obviously, this wouldn't just apply to Conservative cabinet ministers, but to everyone else as well. It seemed to some of us in the House of Lords when the Counterterrorism and Security Act was going through Parliament that our 
propose new duty under that legislation to police non-violent extremism and to exclude non-violent extremism speech that wasn't otherwise unlawful in any way at all might easily be in conflict with our duty to secure free speech under Mrs. Thatcher's Education Act. How could we both tell a visiting speaker that he or she couldn't say something that is perfectly lawful to say and at the same time secure his or her right to free speech? So having been shafted by the Labour Party front bench on our initial amendment, David Panic and I and others put amendments to the bill requiring universities to have particular regard to their pre-existing duty to ensure freedom of speech and academic freedom every time they consider the exercise of any obligation under the Counter-Terrorism and Security Act. The Secretary of State has to have similar regard to free speech and academic freedom when she issues her guidance. Um, and these amendments were strongly supported and the government gave way and conceded the point. Actually, they couldn't really do otherwise. They could hardly say that universities shouldn't have regard to a, a, a statutory obligation to maintain free speech. But I do think this was a concession and a change which altered the landscape in fundamental ways. And it's for this reason, and again, I address the lawyers more than anyone else in saying this. It seems to me very likely that the public importance naturally accorded to a university's statutory obligation to maintain freedom of speech and academic freedom would be accorded very significant weight by any court considering an application for a mandatory order against a university from the Secretary of State. I think it's very easily arguable that where you're balancing a duty to contemplate banning non-violent speech that breaks no laws at all against the duty to uphold free expression within a university of all places where its exercise is especially critical, free expression will trump every time. And it's equally obvious that where you're balancing the importance of academic research within the context of statute-sanctioned respect for academic freedom, its role within a free university cannot be undermined in the absence of strict illegality. It seems clear that an ability on the part of a university to show it's considered the risks of a particular piece of research and balance those risks against the importance of free academic inquiry will be sufficient to render its conduct compliant with this legislation. And of course it's impossible to deny the central place of free expression in universities or the centrality of free expression to research and academic freedom. A university without free expression is like a, a body uh, with no bloodstream and this is not a new idea. When Europe's first university was founded in Bologna in the mid-11th century, its originating charter, its founding charter, embraced the revolutionary principle that scholars, and so ideas, should be free to pass without hindrance. They should not be oppressed by borders. This notion was both real and a metaphor, and its, mes and its message has chimed, I think, down the ages. And this is why it would be such a grave mistake for universities to collude in any way in the closing down of discussion or to indulge a government that wants them to regulate or even to ban speech on campus that isn't otherwise criminal. I think that the way to respond uh, to the prevent duty uh, in the universities is to adopt a minimal approach that secures compliance but equally protects free expression. I think the same can be done in the area of research. We should acknowledge an issue uh, around radicalization, preferably, I think, as a welfare issue. And I think we should use existing welfare mechanisms to deal with it. But we should also, consistent with the existing law, keep open all the channels of discourse and exchange that presently make us what we are. I think we can do both. My own view is that our new Vice Chancellor, Professor Louise Richardson, was absolutely right when she said in an interview recently that she would not hesitate with the provision of counter-argument to have an organisation like CAGE speaking at the University of Oxford. I wouldn't hesitate either. And I think the government's attacks on UCL and King's College London in this regard are unfair, ignorant and philistine. And I think they should be resisted and I think we should be supporting those institutions uh, in that situation. I don't pretend that by complying even to the extent that I've suggested with Prevent, we're not giving up anything. But I do believe that by measuring our response in the ways I've hinted at and by drawing the line at criminal speech so that non-criminal discourse may continue to flow, we can, without too much difficulty, protect what is most important. Security ambition in the Home Office can run very high 
It is, I think, um, our duty to respond to it by availing ourselves of the undoubted space that the amended legislation and guidance give us to exercise discretion and to exercise it firmly in favour of speech and research. And I'm confident that showing that we have given the issues consideration and bearing in mind our free expression duty context will be more than sufficient for us to justify the choices that we've made. In a recent issue of the London Review of Books, Sir Stephen Sedley, a very distinguished retired Court of Appeal judge and visiting fellow at this college, described the development of security policy and practice as increasingly, quote, shrouded in secrecy, part of a growing constitutional model that raises the question as to whether the tripartite separation of powers, legislative, judicial, and executive, contended for by Madison, Locke, and Montesquieu, still holds good. He identified a situation in which, in many democracies, the security apparatus is able to exert a measure of power over the other limbs of state <coughs> that approaches autonomy. In this sense, it can procure legislation, it dominates decision-making in its sphere of influence, and it even seeks to lock its antagonists out of judicial processes as it intrudes ever further into the reaches of civil society, taking a growing interest even in those interactions between citizens that are not only entirely lawful, but as David Anderson has implied, intrinsic to the democratic process and therefore to the maintenance of the rule of law. Perhaps there's a lesson here for an appropriate response to the more extreme aspects of the Counter and Terrorism Security Act that was itself designed to deal with extremism. The best way to deal with extremist speech, it seems to me, is rarely to stop listening, let alone to stop talking. To go back to where I started uh, this brief um, address this evening, it might not be a bad start for us to reply to David Cameron that actually obey the law and we'll leave you alone is a better stab at what he'd call British values than anything to be found um, in this new legislation. Thank you.